Hello and welcome to a special mutual fund report card that we bring you every quarter based on Crystal's mutual fund rankings. Joining us in the studio today are Jiju Vardarajan, Head of Funds and Fixed Income Research at Crystal Research, Mr. Bhupendra Sethi, Fund Manager at Tata AMC and Dinesh Ahuja, Fund Manager at SBI Mutual Fund. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. I'd like to start by asking both of the fund managers here today, how is the market mood right now and how are fund managers reading the markets? If, we, if you look at it, when we began in January, there was a rally with sustained for a while, but now that seems to have cooled off quite a bit. In fact, May has been an absolute carnage on the last week. Bupendra, if we start with you, how are you reading the market mood right now? I think you said it right. Uh, there was a big risk on rally from January 2012 onwards uh, based on the, uh, the LTROs by the ECB. And there was a risk on rally globally, and India also benefited. We got a lot of FI inflows, especially in uh, February of the tune of $5 billion. So Jan to March, we got $9 billion. What has happened the last one month is clearly now there's a big risk of uh, Greece exiting Euro. Uh, so from a global perspective, that's a big risk. And also India has seen uh, its currency depreciate very sharply. I think all that has put the mood in the market uh, in, a, in a very somber mood. And I think that's why perhaps the market has corrected sharply. Right. Dinesh, how about you? Do you agree with what Vipendra said? Yeah, I think there's a lot of nervousness uh, prevailing, a lot of uncertainty on, on a lot of aspects. So I think uh, we've got some pain to go ahead. Uh, but uh, probably one could look at this as a buying opportunity. Okay, great. Bhupendra, you did mention a lot of the both the national and the international issues that have been plaguing the markets for a while. Do you think the pain is over? Do you think, or do you think there's more to continue? Do you think the Greece uh, saga is likely to pan out for some more time going ahead? I think what's happening is that, in a sense, the uh, you know there have been elections in France and Greece, and the way things are evolving in Europe, they're forcing the European leaders to really you know take a stand. Either you go for a complete uh, fiscal union or you decide if some countries have to exit. I think depending on how the things really shape up, uh, you know, markets are going to react. So if there's a move towards fiscal union, then uh, obviously things will stabilize and there'll be no knee-jerk reaction in the market. And the volatility will be reduced. But of course, the, you know, uh, it'll take a long time for the Eurozone to come back to very strong health and growth. But for the near term, things will, I think, uh, move on smoothly. But should uh, you know country exit or euro, then clearly you know there's going to be a lot of uncertainty and volatility in the market. Right, Tiju, I'd like to bring you in at this point. Give us a sense of how you've seen the quarter go by, especially for the mutual fund industry. The pain is continuing. AUMs are dropping. How are you reading the quarter gone by? Okay, in terms of the you know, our reading of the quarter, you know March ended uh, quarter. Uh, it is uh, you know pretty different. You know, unlike a lot of the quarters that we've seen recently. Uh, both Bupinder and Dinesh spoke about how, you know, markets uh, rallied during the quarter. So what we've seen is uh, equity funds um, on an average have given positive returns. Uh, small and mid-cap uh, as a category was amongst the better performer, uh, you know, as compared to large cap and other diversified funds. Uh, also another point uh, to highlight here uh, is the fact that um, almost all of these categories actually underperform their benchmark indices on an average. And uh, part of the, you know, the reason at least that we could attribute to was uh, on account of the fact that uh, a lot of these funds had cash on their books, which, uh, you know, really led to them not really being able to capitalize on the rally. Uh, so that's broadly, you know, our assessment of the the quarter gone by. Is in fact, most of the funds, as he said, have underperformed the benchmark, and the, the whole idea of holding on to cash has, you know, played negatively for a lot of the funds. In these kind of challenging times, does your strategy change? What is the strategy that you are looking at right now? How have you made changes, and what sectors are you looking at? I think our strategy is that uh, when the markets are under a lot of stress, that also means that valuations are attractive. And uh, I think our strategy in general is that whenever valuations are attractive, markets under stress, that's the time to really deploy cash to get into good business franchises and to get fully invested. Uh, and that's what we've been doing in our funds. In terms of what's looking good, so I think what's happening in the Indian market is that there is a core set of uh, sectors like consumption-oriented, consumer-facing sectors, um, private sector banks. And these are on, in a sweet spot. Also, if I may add the pharmaceutical and you know some of the IT stocks, because you know rupees depreciating, they are well positioned there. So some parts of the markets are you know uh, these companies are doing well, and their stock prices are reflecting that. And some of these actually stocks are at all-time high, uh, uh, lifetime high, not just year high. Mm -hmm. 
so basically uh, the other thing is that a lot of these companies uh, have good governance, have good managements, have superior return ratios. So for uh, we naturally like these kind of attributes in companies. So some of these companies are at the core of our portfolios. Around that, you know, we are always trying to buy companies which have fallen out of favor, uh, where valuations are low, business near term is tough, but uh, these are because of cyclical factors. So as uh, risk on rally happens, as policy makers execute better, as things, you know, come to normalcy in India and globally, these companies will bounce back. So that sort of forms the, you know, periphery of the portfolio. So basically, that's the approach that we have. Which is which is kind of an approach which has worked for the Tata Contra Fund, where you do look for funds for uh, stocks that are actually underperforming and the valuations are good. Can you tell us what your plans going ahead for this particular fund are? So if you look at Tata Contra Fund, you know, basically uh, our basic approach is that we want to buy some of the best businesses in the country, but we typically want to buy them on bad news, because what bad news does is that even a good company gets sold off. So, for example, a couple of days back, you know, one of the leading companies, their weightage got reduced in MSCI index. So nothing fundamental happened to that company, but there are technical pressures. So the bad news can hit a company for various reasons. It could be a bad quarterly result. It could be some technical position which is there in the stock because of which it's got sold off. So we are always looking for good companies, trying to buy them on bad news because bad news allows us to buy a very good company at cheaper valuations. I think that's what really we've done in Tata Contra Fund. And that's really worked well because you're buying very good businesses, but at cheaper valuation. So I think I this is a, you know, uh, in a sense, a very opportunistic approach to investing. The template of the companies we want to buy, the, the superior businesses in the country, that list is always ready with us. And we're always looking for bad news in those companies. And that, that's basically the approach in Tata Contra Fund. And that approach is going to continue. The other thing which we do in Tata Contra Fund is that we look for companies where the valuations are cheap. You know, in terms of price to book, in terms of price to earning, in terms of various valuation metrics that are there, the companies are, you know, priced very attractively. So that's the other set of companies that we try to buy in the Tata Contra Fund. The third set of companies that we look for buying in Tata Contra Fund is companies where the business franchise is very strong, uh, but the companies are underappreciated. They're not really uh, out of favor, but they're underappreciated and they're under owned currently. And those are the set of companies that we want to buy. So essentially, these three kind of companies we want to buy in Tata Contra Fund, and that's paid off well. And we want to stick to the knitting and we want to do what we've done in the past so the fund continues to do well in the future also. I'd like to bring you in at this point. Your debt fund has been ranked number one on the Crystal Mutual Fund rankings, but a lot of your uh, your, your core portfolio includes papers of uh, PSU banks. Now, the asset quality of PSU banks has been a concern, and a lot of people feel is likely the concern is likely to continue going ahead. What is your reading of the situation? Do you feel that this is likely to go on? I don't think the situation has uh, reached a point where we really need to panic. Uh, of course, we are holding on to papers of uh, which are you know much shorter duration. Uh, we are holding on to PSU bank CDs and you know a few AAA rated corporate papers which are maturing uh, in the near in the next three months t three years time. I don't think that's that's much of a concern in the in this in the near term at least. Okay, let me ask you the one question that's on everyone's mind: interest rates. Yeah. Interest rate has been on the interest rates have been like reducing for for a while now. How does that affect debt funds and how are you changing your strategy based on interest rates now? Okay, uh, interest rates have been actually volatile in the near term. We expect rates to remain volatile, you know, probably for the next couple of quarters. But going ahead to support uh, domestic growth, the RBI would have to reduce rates. Of course, based on uh, certain assumptions that the government would, you know, move ahead with either, uh, you know, increasing fuel prices, which would give comfort to the RBI to cut rates going ahead. If that happens, long duration funds would outperform because as interest rates go down, your cap your uh, there's a capital appreciation in the securities that you hold and therefore the investor stands to benefit right. how are you changing your strategy now do you uh, what kind of uh, changes are you bringing about to your portfolio based on the interest rate movement okay. currently we are uh, holding on to a very conservative kind of uh, uh, duration uh, going ahead uh, probably june july in the next couple of quarters you we would get ample opportunity to build in duration considering the uh, excessive supply of government paper that's there in the market I think that again would be a buying opportunity and just holding on uh, patiently for that appropriate time to come in. Right. Uh, one question that we get from a lot of our viewers, especially the retail uh, investors, is that are 
debt mutual funds better than bank FTs. Now, with interest rates falling, what is your take on this? Do you think that perhaps debt, debt mutual funds will still give better returns than a bank FT? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, considering our view is that interest rates would come down, uh, bond markets are actually, you know, uh, giving you a pretty high accrual today. I mean, papers are available at pretty high accrual. So as you go ahead, you know, you get an accrual, higher accrual. Also, you get capital appreciation as rates move down. Uh, over and above that, debt mutual funds give you the benefit of, uh, you know, uh, tax. You know, you, you, you come into a dividend option and the retail investor would get uh, tax benefit there you know, a, a lower tax rate. So it's definitely better than an FD. Right. Kiju, I'd like to bring you in at this point. How, how, what are the trends that you are seeing in the debt side over the past quarter? What are you picking up from the rankings? Okay. In terms of debt funds, uh, you know, if you look at the longer horizon funds, which is typically income and uh, guild funds, what we see is uh, income funds doing relatively better than guild funds. Also, what is, uh, you know, uh, uh, quite interesting about the portfolio or the, the average duration that income funds have, it's on the lower side. So, you know, a lot of income funds have been investing into short term papers, uh, you know, predominantly cashing on the high rates that CDs are offering at this point of time. Uh, in case of the shorter horizon funds, which are typically or liquid, ultra short um, categories, uh, liquid funds have been doing relatively better. Right. And also I'd like to ask you now from the equity side as well. Now when we last spoke, you spoke of how large caps were doing much better than mid caps. But earlier on you told us that this has actually reversed in this quarter. Can you give us the trends as far as the equity funds are concerned? Yeah, equity funds, uh, you know, as I had spoken earlier, mid cap is, you know, what uh, had done, uh, you know, uh, better uh, during the quarter. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, as compared to the large cap and the diversified categories. So mid cap is, you know, the category which has really done uh, better. Again, uh, you know, March was a, a, a quarter which actually saw a lot of uh, uh, sectors doing well. So mid cap as an index, the mid cap index itself done, did fairly well. So, you know, this was a different uh, period, you know, which really saw with the mid cap funds capitalizing on the rally. Right. Bhupendra, I'd like to ask you something. Now, from a larger mutual fund uh, industry perspective, how are you reading the fund flows coming in right now? Because a lot of NFOs, especially the equity ones, have not really been able to garner, uh, garner a lot of um, you know, investor interest, especially in terms of retail investors. How are fund flows looking? I think uh, the NFO culture was there till 2007, 2008. The market has moved since. Uh, clearly, there's not much appetite for new fund offerings unless there is a very unique fund which is uh, being offered. Uh, but I think most of the fund houses have fairly, you know, good set of uh, different funds on offer for investors. Uh, so I think uh, clearly the the uh, investor interest has moved to funds which are doing well. On a net basis, we have seen, you know, for the financial year ending uh, March 2012. Uh, though the gross inflows are quite lot, but you know net of redemptions are hardly an inflow in the mutual fund industry. So clearly, uh, at at, a, at an aggregate level, you know there's not much money which has come into the mutual fund industry. But if you look at fund specifics, uh, there's a very discerning trend that the funds which are doing well, they are getting very good net inflows, mm. and the funds which are not doing well, they are uh, basically facing outflows. So you know in that sense, you know markets have become very discerning funds which are performed well with good track record, they are f getting inflows. And I'd also like to ask you at this point, what about the retail investors? What are they doing? How are the SIP flows? Do you see SIPs continuing? Have people pulled out in, in for, for Tata especially? How are you seeing uh, the retail investor behavior? I think uh, we have seen uh, at an industry level, the SIPs, yes, people are holding back uh, the SIPs, which typically happens when, you know, uh, markets haven't done well or markets go down. Actually, people should be stepping up SIPs, but unfortunately, when the mood is nervous, people actually you know, hold back and they stop their SIPs. So I think uh, that's the you know the retail. Uh, this is the nature of the retail investors. Uh, but I think uh, people should understand that when the markets go down, the idea of doing SIP is that you will not try to time the market. That you will be able to actually plow in money when the markets are down. So you will be actually able to benefit from you know down ticks in the market and substantially so. So I think retail investors need to really move on to that kind of mindset and need to actually step up the SIPs when the markets are down. But sadly, I think uh, you know uh, financial literacy is still to pick up, uh, and we need to uh, coach and guide people that you know sh you should not stop SIPs when the markets are down. You should actually step it up. 
Right, did you, do you, uh, because from what we see from the mutual fund rankings that have come out for the last quarter, there have been a, a sizable chunk of people who have actually retained their SIPs and not pulled out. How are you reading the whole SIP story going uh, on? I, we actually, uh, at least I would tend to agree with uh, Bupinder in terms of uh, the fact that, you know, investments have continued into funds which have really done well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you were to look at uh, consistent performers, the uh, asset sizes have, you know, grown for those funds. Uh, you know, largely, and this can largely be attributed to SIP uh, flows coming in. And uh, clearly, SIP is, uh, uh, you know, if you were to just look at the past uh, performance of, you know, consistent investing through SIPs, uh, you would tend to do well, uh, you know, because of the various benefits that SIPs offer. So, in terms of the overall trend, at least we believe that SIPs are continuing into funds that are doing well. I agree with Bupinder, there is a lot of scope still for a lot of uh, investor education in that space for, you know, to, for people to really get the message that stopping an SIP, you know, when the market, uh, when the market is not really doing well, is not the right sort of an investment decision to make. I'd like to bring you in at this point, Dinesh. Now, when we talk SIPs, it's generally assumed that we're talking about equity SIPs. Right. There hasn't been too much of retail interest as such in getting into debt. How are you looking at the retail participation in the debt mutual fund space? Okay, um, you know, considering the elevated uh, interest rates on the shorter end, we've seen a lot of, uh, you know, interest by retail investors into the FMP space. Mm -hmm. Of late, we've seen uh, a lot of traction building onto the short-term funds and, you know, even the long-duration funds. But the traction is probably not to that great an extent. I think uh, it's we are aggressively marketing these funds, and depending upon the investors' risk appetite, we're advising them to get into either short-term funds or duration funds at this particular point in time. Richard, I'd like to also take your opinion on this. There has, as, I, as uh, Dinesh also said, that the interest in the debt space from, from retail investors yeah. has been almost entirely in FMPs. Do you see this and do you see perhaps a little more interest coming in slowly or not at all? I think it's also, uh, you know, it again comes back to investor education. I think, uh, you know, you, you had that question in terms of how, uh, you know, mutual funds really fare against FDs. So if you actually look at, uh, you know, the different types of products that mutual funds offer on the debt side, you have products, you know, that can uh, that can address different cycles of the, you know, different interest rate cycles. So you have uh, liquid, uh, ultra short and uh, short term funds and also FMPs, you know, which, which are good products to really get into when the interest rates harden. Likewise, you have income and guild funds, you know, which are very good avenues to get into, you know, when interest rates are coming down. So I think it's largely a, you know, a, a factor of the investor awareness about the variety of funds that are on offer on the debt side and the way in which they can really benefit from those funds. Right. I'd like to uh, now ask both the fund managers that for, th for your funds, which have been ranked number one, what exactly are your plans going ahead to continue to re retain this number one status for Finder? As I said, uh, Tata Contra Fund approach is to buy the, you know, very good businesses and try to use bad news to, you know, have a very attractive entry point. We'll continue to do that. We'll continue to focus on valuations and we'll continue to, you know, try and find out companies which are undiscovered and underappreciated. So basically, this is the approach. Stick to the knitting and, you know, keep on buying into good quality companies. And Dinesh, for the dynamic bond fund? Okay, considering that interest rates are volatile uh, and expected to remain volatile in the near term, we would stick to the most liquid of the asset class so that we can, you know, churn and generate some returns there. Be a bit conservative for the next quarter or so and uh, build in duration as and when an opportunity arises when rates are higher. Right. Did you find the last word from you? What I'd like to understand is for a retail investor, do you still believe that even in these volatile times, mutual funds are the best place to invest? And what has the kind of performance been? And do you think this kind of performance is likely to continue? Absolutely. I think the most important factor is to really time, uh, you know, time in a sense, you really match your uh, investment uh, option with the risk appetite that you have and the investment horizon that you have. Mutual funds clearly offer you a lot of different options, you know, that can really suit your risk profile and investment horizon. So from that perspective, clearly mutual funds are the best bet. Okay, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining. We, live, we will leave it at that. And we will return next quarter to bring you all these thoughts and revisit them once more again. Thank you for being with us.